Are you prepared to die? Aside from a traffic ticket, Darlie Routier had never had a brush with the law. Now, she could be the first woman in more than a hundred years put to death by the state of Texas. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, it's Maya Mystery. Sorry I've been away for a while, there's been a lot going on in my personal life, but I really wanted to get back to you guys and make a video for you now that we're in 2021, which to be honest doesn't seem that different from 2020, but I digress from what I want to talk about today. Today I want to talk about a case that I recently rediscovered um over christmas time i watched a couple of documentaries on it and it really intrigued my interest because it really got me scratching my head because i'm still not 100 percent convinced of the verdict for this case there's still some things that don't really make sense to me and i wanted to share them with you guys and get your point of view on it because it's always really important to me and that's the case of darley ruchier who was charged and convicted of the murder of one of her sons but accused of the murder of both and um, she's on death row at the moment and she hasn't been executed and this was back in the 90s so it's been a really long drawn out execution and i think a lot of that's due to the fact that a lot of people aren't 100 percent sure of her guilt what happened in small town rowlett texas was unthinkable yet it began as just an ordinary night for darley routier her husband and seven-month-old were asleep upstairs, and Darley says she and her sons Damon and Devon had fallen asleep downstairs in front of the TV in the family room. Then, at 2.31 a.m., Darley phoned 911. The very first thing I hear is a glass break. Darley's husband, Darren, sleeping upstairs. And then I hear a scream of Darley screaming as loud as she can. It came from the family room downstairs, where, remember, Darley and the boys had fallen asleep watching TV. I'm coming downstairs, running straight over to Devin. And when I get to Devin, there's these big gashes, and there's blood all over. And the very first thing I do is I go down on the top of him, and I'm patting him on the face, and I'm, Devin, Devin, Devin. Devon was dead, stabbed twice in the chest with such force the knife went through to the carpet. Damon was stabbed too, four times in the back. He was clinging to life, and Darley's throat had been slashed nearly fatally. Yet she was frantically calling for help. First thing I saw was blood on the floor in the entranceway to the house. Officer David Waddell arrived within minutes. And I could see Darley Routier talking on the telephone. She was yelling, uh, talking to the dispatcher, telling her that her kids were dying, that they had been stabbed. She's saying this man went out, and he came in, and he killed the babies. And I mean, we're just freaking. By the time paramedic Jack Colby got there. I walked over to uh, Damon and bent down and examined the child. And that's when he gasped. It was the last time that he would breathe on his own looked into his face and his eyes were still open. Uh, I could still see that there was some life in that, in those eyes. And I remember thinking that, uh, you know, this kid's a fighter and he wants to live. Damon died before he reached the hospital. And Darley might have died, except the knife stopped two millimeters short of her carotid artery. When she came out of surgery, Police were waiting to question her. She was awakened, she said, by Damon, pushing on her shoulder, but in the dark didn't notice he was hurt. Then she saw a man moving through the kitchen and followed him as he went through a door and into the garage. She saw a knife and picked it up. Only then, she said, did she return to find Devon, who was dead, and Damon dying. So I wanted to delve into the case with you guys and first of all I like to examine the body language and sort of get the vibes of what I you know pick up on from the defendant and I have to admit not great Darley Routier doesn't really give me um I don't know what it is about her but there's something about her behavior that I'm just not buying into you know 
There's been a lot made of Darlie's behaviour after the crimes, during the crime and even on death row. That are, is strange, but we can't really try someone on strange behaviour. But yeah, there's things about her that sort of ring alarm bells to me. Like, for example, there is Dupe and Delight. I'll play a clip right now where it seems like very strong Dupe and Delight um, to me. I did not murder my children. I love them. So it I love them. And it goes without saying the silly string incident is very unusual if you don't know about this case um a piece of evidence in court was a video of darley spraying silly string on her son's grave just shortly after the murder just laughing dancing saying that she was celebrating his birthday which even just talking about that now you know it's apparent how strange that is and also in the interviews that she does, like I said, there's things I'm not buying. Actually, at the end of one of the interviews, she actually sung a song for her um, surviving son, um, where she sung a song at the end of the interview. And it all seems a little bit, I'm an innocent little girl, please believe me, I'm so sweet. I don't know, maybe I'm jumping the gun in that, but at the end of the day, it feels a little bit more like a Broadway musical and a true crime tragedy. So Darlie Routier asked us to record this videotape for her son. It's the hymn she used to sing to Drake at bedtime. Love me, oh yes, Jesus loves me from the Bible. Tell I don't know, makes me scratch my head about her. But I have to go into sort of detail about the things that also plant doubt in my mind. So the first thing that conflicts me on her guilt is the sock. And I'm sure if you're familiar with this case, you know what I'm talking about. There was a sock found a reasonable distance away from the root tier's house after this crime was committed, which sort of signals in your brain that maybe an assailant ran out of the house and dropped a sock. Why he would have took a sock, I don't know. But the sock did have one of the victim's blood on it. Um, it does sort of make it harder to believe that Darley could have committed the crimes, left the house without any trail of blood, put the sock there, came back, then inflicted the wounds on herself. Um, that made it look like she was attacked too. So the sock being present in this case is a big red flag for me. Kelly's attorneys insisted that she did not fit the profiles of mothers who kill their children. And they seized on a key piece of evidence, a sock found down the alley, three houses from the murder scene. It was stained with the blood of both boys. But there was no blood trail leading to it. And remember, Darley was bleeding profusely. In order to commit the murders, Darley would first have had to stab the boys, then take that sock and plant it 75 yards down the alley. Then she would have had to return to the house, slit her own throat, and stage a phony crime scene. And all this, according to the timeline that night, within two to three minutes, so the second thing I want to talk about, and this is something that hasn't really been talked about that much, is her husband Darren, who was there once the murders were committed. He was upstairs, he lived in a very big house, so, you know, maybe he didn't realise what was going on until it was too late. But what was really unusual about Darren is after the murders and after Darley's conviction, they did a lie detector test on Darren to try and find out if he knew more information than he was letting on. And he failed the lie detector test. And even when he was confronted about this, he showed a lot of dupe and delight. As the investigator said, he was smiling at the investigator once the investigator was accusing him of knowing more than he let on. This is really unusual. And then to add fuel to that fire, Apparently, Darren was arranging someone to burgle the house to claim some insurance money. So one thing that is very hard to explain in the case of Darley's guilt is the inflicted wounds on Darley. Um, apparently, it was so close to one of her arteries that if it was two millimetres more, 
deeper, she would have died. She wouldn't have made it. How Darley would have known to, you know, keep the blade two millimeters away from a very important artery is, you know, quite unusual. Um, it does sort of make you think, huh, you know, that is, that would be hard to do. But then again, also on the other side, um, maybe she wasn't thinking, maybe she could have killed herself, which will bring me to one of the things I think is a good case for her guilt. So one of the things that made people very suspicious about Darley was her over-concern about the prints on the murder weapon. Um, she immediately brought that up when she was on the phone, which is very unusual. Um, I guess the investigators immediately picked up on that, that there was sort of an over-concern for prints on the murder weapon. Um, why would she be so concerned if she was innocent? Another thing I wanted to talk about is in the interviews, Darley says that she can't remember what happened. I think that's a bit too convenient. If you can't fully remember what happened, it means that you have an excuse for when your claims conflict themselves in trial. If you suddenly say, I just can't remember what happened. And also in interviews, she says she can't remember what happened, but she does remember a man attacked her and she does remember what was happening and that he ran out this way. And it all just doesn't make sense. Her story doesn't really add up. So very suspicious. Darley conceded it would be hard to sleep through it. I know I didn't sleep through that. I mean, how would anybody sleep through something like that? But yet you say you don't remember. But I don't remember. Can you imagine waking up out of your sleep with a man attacking you? Well, what do you think happened then if you can't remember but you don't think you slept through it? I think that I tried to fight with a man and I think that he either knocked me unconscious or I think that when, you know, he slit my throat or whatever, I think I um, passed out. But of course, the biggest condemning factor is Darley's behaviour after the murders. Like I said, the silly string and her demeanour and even the way she conducts interviews, it's just very strange. It doesn't sort of seem very genuine, even when you're watching her talk about what happened she doesn't seem very distressed immediately it seems to come on after I know if this happened to me or any other person we'd be so traumatized that it would immediately show in our demeanor once we bring up this situation whether Darley's just an emotionally sort of cold person or not very reactive we don't know but that combined with everything else does make a strong case for her guilt what really worked for the prosecution at the trial was this videotape of the party at the grave. I asked Darley to look at it again. Do you not say as I do, oh for heaven's sake Darley, chewing gum, smiling, spraying silly straw, well, and the jury wanted to see it over and over again. You still don't think it was wrong? No. Maybe it's not the way that everybody would choose to do. But I can guarantee you the last thing a guilty person would do was to do that. So if you ask me my opinions on it, I'm really not sure, like I said, but if Darley is guilty, what I think happened um, was that it was an attempted suicide gone wrong, um, like the Susan Smith case. Susan Smith, if you're not aware of it, drove her car with her two sons into a river, but she got out just before the car went in. Her sons didn't, very sadly, and um, she was charged with the murder. Darley had been writing letters about how unhappy she was and she was going through a lot of trouble. She did write in one letter at one time, forgive me for what I'm about to do, which could have meant anything, but to me sort of seems like a suicide. Did Darley plan to kill her sons and herself, but then survive the fatal neck wound and realise maybe that she didn't want to die, you know, near the end of what was happening? Um that she wanted to live, it's a possibility, and then was caught up in this whole mess. Or, on the other hand, did someone really break in and do this? Was Darren responsible? Did Darren plan this out and, you know, didn't want Darley to die, wanted to collect the insurance money from the kids, which is a horrible thought to think about. But 
as we know from studying people on my channel, people are really capable of anything. It's a very interesting case and I'd love to hear what you guys think about it and what you hear about my theories on it. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this video and Happy New Year and I hope it's going well for you. And I'll see you again with another video very soon. Bye.